we approach everything from a very cognitive perspective while you know a lot of our thoughts and everything obviously are like happening in our mind a lot of times that bypasses the you know body and the subconscious kind of like reactions that we have um the sensations the uncomfortable sensations that come up in our body because it's totally possible for us to keep on telling myself oh i believe i'm worthy i believe i'm worthy i believe i'm worthy but then when there's like an opportunity to show that i feel i'm worthy if my body contracts and i get overwhelmed with fear and panic and anxiety i'm not going to be able to move forward even if i'm telling myself in my mind you're safe to do this, like you're worthy, blah, blah, blah. I really found it empowering to learn more about somatic healing and connecting to your body and really working on releasing this trauma that's stored in your body so that these new beliefs actually feel safe in your body and you can embody them rather than just think them. Hello and welcome to The Ally Show. My name is Ali Islamifar and I'm your host for the show. We are here with our episode number eight, where we are chatting with Amanda Grover. Amanda is a director of brand marketing at Higher Influence. She also founded a storyteller groove to help creatives build and promote their personal brands. In our very open conversation with Amanda, we will be talking about a lot of things that happened to her growing up and dealing with a lot of bullying and harassment that she has been facing. So if these are sensitive topics to you, please skip this episode and we'll hope to see you in the next episode of The Ally Show. Also, if you're suffering from any mental health issues, please immediately contact your medical or mental health experts to get the help that you need. Amanda is currently going through a yoga teacher training program, so she actually brought a very special gift to our episode and she will be practicing a body scan meditation in the end of this episode. So hopefully you will stay through the end of it and you will practice that with us as well. Amanda's accountability campaign for this episode is also related to the practice that she is bringing to the show, which is a combo of body scanning and journaling. She will talk more about it in the end of the show. As always, the best way to support our show is to subscribe to our channels wherever you're listening to your podcasts, including Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Also, you may actually share this content with whoever that you know is in the need of such content. This is the best way to spread the love and spread the word around. There's also one housekeeping item that I would love to share. Starting March 1st, I've started this new project called WePause, which is a 30-minute weekly meeting, which is happening through Google Meet for now. Everyone is welcome to join. In every session, we have at least a guest that is bringing a practice so that all of us can improve our mental health together. To sign up, please go to wepause.space slash sign up. For every week, we are also aiming to leave a recording of those conversations into our podcast so you may start seeing them popping up. I'm so excited for the next few weeks that we have ahead of us as we have a great lineup of our guest instructors. Now, without further ado, let's start our conversation with Amanda Grover. We are here with Amanda Grover. Uh, I think the story for how we met is so cool and interesting to me. It just summarizes my life uh, as far as like how lucky I am to meet people in the most random places. Uh, it was just a few months ago. I was in Vancouver catching up with some friends uh, and we decided to go to a techno show. And there we go. You were also traveling to Vancouver because you're not from there. You don't live there. You were also traveling to Vancouver and you and Sid showed up there and I met you guys and we chatted and how many things we had in common was honestly so crazy at the moment. And the more we talked uh, following that event, the more uh, I felt like this is absolutely a conversation that everyone else has to hear. So I'm so happy that you're here. I'm so excited. Uh, it would be amazing if you can uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, definitely. And I couldn't agree more. It was just such a crazy meeting. And 
I know we're both into yoga and all these synchronicities and everything. And so it just felt like it was meant to be. And when you're an open channel, you know, these opportunities that are meant for you just come your way naturally. And to give some background on me, I am a marketer. I worked in public relations for about five years. And now I work for an influencer marketing agency while I work on building my own personal brand as well. I'm the founder of Storytellers Grow, which helps people looking to build personal brands really connect to themselves and connect to their beliefs and their mission to really make an impact in the world. And through my work, I really blend my background in marketing with my interest in all things yoga, spirituality, and connecting to your body. So that's a bit about me, and I'm so excited to be here today. So thanks, Ali. I also heard your other podcast recording with uh, another friend. Uh, I thought that was great. Uh, we can we can talk about it whenever you had time and introduce that episode so people can tune into that one if they're interested to these types of conversations. Um, also, I thought one thing you said before this call to me uh, was very interesting. I, I want to start the conversation from there because uh, you mentioned you were feeling a little bit not prepared or but uh, you started like doing yoga before this call. I want to I wanna hear that story a little bit more and um, understand why Nidra Yoga, why did you do that? What does it do to you? Yeah, of course. So when I first started my spiritual journey, I became really interested in learning more about masculine and feminine energy and really learning how I can balance the two to really, you know, have the biggest impact in my work and feel most connected to my work. And so I see the masculine energy as, you know, preparing, you know, I... Before this call, I had all of my notes to really think about the talking points that I wanted to bring to this conversation so I could feel confident in the message I had to share. But then the other aspect of that is making sure that I feel really safe and connected to my body so that I can share this message from a really authentic place. And so prior to this call, yesterday, I spent the time on the talking points. And then, you know, the hour before this call, I sat down, I laid out my yoga mat, I put on a blanket, and I listened to a yoga nidra recording, uh, who I got from my friend Ashley. We actually recently just hosted a retreat together to really help people connect to their voice and feel safe to unleash it. And so her yoga nidra practice, yoga nidra is actually, um, it's more of a still practice. So it's a little similar to a meditation. It's not as much movement as typical yoga, and it's referred to as uh, yogic sleep. And so this practice is really meant to, you know, slow down, uh, or it's supposed to um, help your body kind of fall asleep while your mind remains awake, which is kind of the opposite of regular sleep. And so throughout this specific process, uh, I mean, practice, it was really focused on, you know, feel connecting to your voice, connecting to your throat chakra and, you know, really understanding that your voice matters to the world and it's safe for the ideas that exist within your body to exist out in the world. And so I really love to bring in those types of practices to ensure that I'm really coming from a very authentic place. Uh, and, you know, kind of quieting those voices in my mind that tell me, oh, it has to be this way or this is what you should be saying or all of those little things that kind of come in and get in the way of your true authentic message. So I really love to blend those two and make sure that I'm having a balance of, you know, the masculine energy and the feminine energy because I really feel like that's where the best work comes from. I replied with a word to that message and I said balance. And I yes. think this this balance uh, of energies that you're talking about, this balance of powers, I would even call them, uh, not just energy. We have, as human beings, we have all these powers inside uh, and like really releasing and un unleashing them at the right that at the right time that they have to be released. Really understanding and finding that balance inside is really a hard work to be done. Practices like yoga, things that taking you back to your origin, things that taking you back to your body, your actual connection that matters, those things really help you to start like figuring out if you have that balance and how to use that balance and how to empower that balance. So that was a very interesting thing you said before the show. I'm also like uh, curious how um, you're using that in your day to day. Like life has a lot to uh, bring to you every day. Like are there other things, are there other situations like recording a show that you say, you know what, this is the time I need to take it 10 minute, 15 minute and go and practice either yoga or meditation. 
Uh, yes. Yeah, so I think that there are so many times in my life that I feel that way. And I think, you know, my healing journey really was rooted in women's empowerment group coaching containers. And in those group coaching containers, we really studied, you know, what does it mean to be a feminine being? And so we really thought about these principles of like trust and surrender and connecting back to the body. And something that I learned while reading this book called Spectre of Sex is that Plato argued that, you know, women had this greater association with their body and men signified the rational soul, which I found so interesting because in The Power of Now, it talks about how men's biggest obstacle to enlightenment is the thinking mind, whereas women's biggest obstacle to enlightenment is the pain body. And so I found this super interesting because I feel like we're living in such like a hyper masculine energy type of world where throughout history, it's kind of been like, almost demonized, you know, all of these like feminine characteristics. And so I feel like it's led to a lot of women feeling like they have to show up in this like very hyper masculine way. Meanwhile, you know, like these feminine characteristics, you know, are very inherent to us and they're very natural to us. And that's where we feel most powerful when we're able to tap into these things. And we feel this connection to our body. And so one of the things that really got me, you know, interested in women's empowerment coaching is I followed this girl that I went to elementary school with and like middle school and high school. We didn't really talk much growing up, but I felt so drawn to her Instagram content because she was talking about all of these, you know, concepts of like reclaiming the feminine. And she was talking about cycle syncing. And, you know, for a while in my career, I was kind of like, oh, my gosh, like I go through these cycles where I feel like, you know, this week I'm so productive. And then the other week, like I'm struggling. And, you know, like I was just trying to understand, like, why I wasn't able to like show up in this way that I was expected to. And so her content just resonated with me and made me feel seen. And I was like, wait, maybe this is just like how my body works. (laughs) Like, maybe this there's nothing wrong with me. Maybe I just don't understand how my body actually works. And so, you know, taking that time to really connect to like all of these feminine ideas of what it means to be a feminine being and of course along with that as you said it's very important to have balance right and so we can't just like throw the masculine energy out of the window it's very important and both feminine and masculine energy are so important and it's really about striking that perfect balance between them and not seeing either one as like good or bad seeing them both as like necessary parts of the process and really honoring both of them and so I think the reason why we're seeing all of these you know people on Instagram talking about reclaiming the feminine is just because currently the way that society operates is like very in this like masculine place uh, for various different reasons in my opinion. I cannot not ask this question from you because being in mental health and being uh, uh, in this path, like there are a lot of people to follow. There are a lot of content to see or watch or to read. And I found it very hard to really distinct uh, between contents that are just flashy and just try to like go after an audience versus content that actually come from truly people experienced i'm following you and i think it was interesting to see how genuine and everything 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 you're posting is just very genuine you're sharing uh, experiences of your days like hey today i'm gonna be doing this but i feel this and you're very open how do you as a as a marketing expert now how do you differentiate between uh what content because there is there is a ton like in, in in mental health in this path that we are all in to heal there's a ton of content. How do you differentiate as a marketer? Yeah, totally. So this is something that I think can vary from person to person. I genu- generally believe that I'm just like an open person. I've been that way since I was a child. I always felt really comfortable sharing what's on my mind and the things that I'm going through. But I understand that's not something that everyone is comfortable with. So I think it's really getting to know yourself and getting to know how you can be more of who you are. So just because, and one thing that a previous coach of mine said in the past, which I think is so powerful and so true, is that a lot of times when we see someone else in their power, 
which means just them being authentically them, they're being as much of who they are as they possibly can be. And that's what makes us really drawn to them. A lot of times when we see that, we think, oh, she's an amazing dancer and I'm so drawn to her because she dances like this. And then so we feel like, okay, like I have to learn how to dance or I have to go dance on my Instagram stories. And that's not really the case. It's like that is her. That is her how she is. And like you said, I share things that I'm doing in my day. So I'm just kind of sharing the behind the scenes of my life and like who I am. And so I think that's really the thing that draws people in and gets people connected to you is by really showing who you are and that can manifest in various different ways you know like if you're a musician and you're trying to show and you're releasing a song you know take people along on that journey of you creating that song and you know infuse your personality into it so it doesn't always have to be like oh I'm you know, being really vulnerable right now. I'm sharing, you know, this stuff that makes me super uncomfortable. Like, yes, it's important to push yourself out of your comfort zone and try new things. But at the same time, everybody has their own way of, you know, discerning what do I want to share and what feels like too personal to share. And so I think it's always kind of towing that line of, you know, how can I show up as like the most me I can be? (laughs) Um, And I think, you know, figuring that out takes a lot of Like it's a very inward journey to really understand, okay, who am I? What do I like? What lights me up? Like, what am I interested in? How can I really show people who I am? Because I think a lot of people don't even know who they are, sadly, um, because we're so clouded by conditioning and all of the things that we think we should do that a lot of times we do not follow the things that actually really excite us and, you know, make us really happy and make us who we are. So it's really about, you know, connecting to yourself so that you can show who you are to others. I think it's it's covering the side that hey if I if I want to share something how how to share it now if I want to absorb a content like if there is like hundreds of these pages and influencers and amazing people that I have the choice to go and follow their content how how can I differentiate if this is a content that actually helps me in this path or not like do you also have a secret for that I think I have a story I can give about this as well. So as a, you know, business owner, I wanted to invest into a lot of programs in the beginning to learn as much as I could. Okay, how are these other people doing it? And so I had invested in one coach, The Wellbeing on Instagram. Her name is Lauren Taby and I love her. She has made such a huge impact in my life. Like I'm so grateful for her. And then I had another experience where I worked with another coach And it was a completely opposite experience where I feel like, you know, I wasted some money on that experience and it kind of set me back. The reason why that experience set me back so much was because they were, you know, these sales coaches and they had a very, you know, copy and paste type approach. And that's not something that I believe in. I believe that everyone has their own way of doing things. Everyone needs to find their own groove and figure out, you know, what do I like to do? How do I want to show up in my marketing? How do I want to sell? Because there's not one way to do it in business. There are many different ways based on your business model, based on your personality. And so when I went to this coaching program, it was very like, you have to do it this way. And if you don't do it this way, like you're wrong, you're a failure. And they also used a lot of like manipulative sales tactics, in my opinion. And my husband's also a salesman. So (laughs) we talk about these things all the time. And like we, you know, can understand when something is like, okay, it makes sense. It's a sales practice. But then where is it crossing the line almost? And in that situation, I definitely feel like, you know, they don't use the best practices there. And so I had that experience. And although it, you know, I felt like I wasted money. It also showed me like what I don't want. I think a lot of times we learn a lot through those experiences. I think now when it comes to um, discerning between, you know, who should I follow? Like, who should I invest in? Really make sure that you're investing in them for the right reasons. Make sure that, you know, you know exactly what problem you have and like, are they the person that's going to solve that problem? Because I think a lot of new business owners on the, in the online space, especially almost like invest into coaches thinking that they're going to solve all of their problems when really that's not like the best approach to take. And so that would be some advice when it comes to investing, just make sure you know exactly what the issue is and like 
what the solution is and then sure spend your money but when it comes to just following people i think it's always great to follow people on social media but i also think it's good to have a balance between okay how much social media content am i consuming versus how much long form content am i consuming because when it comes to social media a lot of times these social media posts especially if the person is trying to sell these posts are aimed at you know providing bite-sized pieces of content that also create fomo If you're consistently consuming a bunch of different people's content on social media and all of them are literally just trying to provide bite-sized pieces of content to create FOMO to get you to buy, it's going to lead to a lot of confusion. And that's definitely something that I experienced. And it became very clear to me when I took a break from social media. I took like a month off and I was like, I'm just going to, I need some space from all of the noise. And I ended up, you know, investing in Medium and finding a lot of bloggers that I was really interested in. And through reading those articles, I felt, you know, so much more educated when I left. Like, obviously, I've read a lot of books and everything, but just having those long form pieces of content like articles of hearing other people's perspectives, I felt so much more educated after reading it opposed to like feeling like I was on this never ending hamster wheel when I was just consuming all of this stuff on social media and not really getting the answers that I was seeking. That was an absolute expert comment uh, on (laughs) this this question. I think one thing you said, and I would love to add this if you don't mind, you mentioned something about what problems uh, of yours it's solving. For a very long time, uh, like in general, I had a hard time organizing my life and organizing my day. I'm, I'm not perfect now, still dealing with that. One thing that I noticed recently and I've been practicing it recently is type down my life problems like in a form of absolute user problems. Just like type down what is my problem. By typing it down every, every once in a while, like every couple of months, I noticed that it actually helps me to decide so much faster and easier on what should I do today. Like, for example, like, hey, this is my problem. And based on that today, this call with Amanda is absolute priority. Today, this next call that I have with a, with a developer is absolute priority. But the other call, no, then I'm not going to do that. Or for example, this hangout that friends are saying, let's hang out tonight, that's, that doesn't become priority because... It's not solving some of my big problems I have today. Of course, like we have a lot of like these fillers in our day. I'm not questioning those. But uh, the point being is like really knowing what problems we have in our lives and just typing it down, two, three problems in a lifetime every two, three months. That's been helping me a lot. And I think what you said is really important. Like a lot of time, we don't know what problems we have. We just think we have to go through this path. But why? What what problem do you actually have? Like, I'm not going to say if you know the root cause or not, like you're going to find it in million sessions of therapy probably, but mm-hmm. at least know what problems are you feeling. I feel so anxious, for example. Mm-hmm. I'm anxious. I'm consistently anxious in my day to day. Okay, that's your problem. Write it down. Then next time when you're given something, because all these bite-sized advertisement or posts or Things that we are receiving on daily basis, the signals we get as as soon as we leave it, leave the door of our homes, those signals, then you can decide, then your brain can decide, okay, this is not helping you. This is not helping you. This is helping you absorb it. So I couldn't agree more on figuring out the problems and figuring out, you know, what your goals are. And I think that also takes a lot of time. Um, I read a book called U-Turn. Uh, which really helped me connect to myself. And that was kind of the beginning of all of this. So I also recommend that for people. If you don't really know what your problem is or you don't know what your goals are, um, it really helps you connect to yourself to figure out, you know, what are the things that you want to do and what are the things you want to follow rather than the, what the thing, what you think you should do. <laughs> Going into the My Mental Health uh, story. So growing up, I felt like mental health issues followed me everywhere I went. I felt like most of the people in my family struggled with mental health issues, some of them more severe than others. And at the same time, I was going through, you know, my own struggles with, you know, depression, anxiety. I think all of us can really face those moments, you know, whether it's 
something that happens, you know, consistently or something that comes and goes. I think it's something everyone can relate to because life has a lot of ups and downs. And I specifically really got into women's empowerment coaching because I personally felt like so many of my issues came from all of these social constructs and pressures and ideas of what a woman has to be. And so going from, you know, people calling me stupid a lot growing up feeling and saying that I was like blonder than my cousin who was actually a blonde, I'm not blonde, and kind of like inserting these, you know, dumb blonde stereotypes onto me at a young age, I always felt like I had to kind of prove my intellect. Also, I have two older siblings, both of them are extremely smart. And so following in their footsteps, that was another thing I think kind of added to that layer of feeling like I always needed to prove myself. Uh, on top of that, I've also, you know, dealt with disordered eating for a lot of my life, which I think almost every woman can understand, or and men too, of course, um, but especially women because of, you know, all of these unrealistic beauty standards that are out there really messed with me for a while. And so that was something I definitely wanted to heal from and grow from. And I felt like women could really, you know, share that space with me. I will say that in pretty much every job that I've had, I've dealt with sexual harassment besides the PR agencies that I worked in uh, because they were primarily women. So that was not as much of an issue. Um, and even throughout school, um, so many of those types of experiences. One of the things that I find the most sad is I feel like I've had a lot of issues in female relationships due to this like underlying feeling of like competitiveness and jealousy. And I think a lot of these things that I've struggled with really came from, you know, how media depicts women. Um, making us a lot of times feel like crazy and emotional and dramatic and you know all of these movies that you watch it's like always like the two girls like fighting over the guy or like all of these different storylines that we tell ourselves I really believe that all of these you know archetypes really end up embedding themselves into like our subconscious and they just become like our beliefs about the world I ended up joining a women's empowerment coaching group uh, led by Lauren, who I mentioned earlier. It was so amazing because it just completely like flipped everything I've ever thought on its head. <laughs> and she was just like, what if we like stopped believing that, you know, our worth was determined by like how much we accomplished? Like, what if we believed that we were worthy just as we are? And, you know, going into like money mindset and like all of these limiting beliefs that we kind of just accept as reality, we went into each of them one by one. And also just being in a safe space with women was super empowering and healing for me. Just being able to share my story, share the things that have happened to me, share, you know, the impact that they've had on me and also listening to the other women's stories because I thoroughly believe that we are all just mirrors for each other and we can all find similarities and threads where you know someone might be sharing their story and it's like really healing for you to hear because you're like oh like I went through something super similar and you can kind of connect on that and even just hearing my coach reply to other people's stories was extremely healing for me really taking that time to finally invest in myself was such a huge pivotal moment for me because prior to working in women's empowerment groups I was constantly googling like how do I get rid of my anxiety like what are th like I was always seeking out these answers but I never really felt like I found them until you know I first and foremost you know worked on understanding all of my limiting beliefs and you know kind of creating more expansive beliefs for myself and really working on embodying them but I think the disconnect that a lot of people face when it comes to, you know, unlearning these limiting beliefs is we approach everything from a very cognitive perspective, while, you know, a lot of our thoughts and everything obviously are like happening in our mind. A lot of times that bypasses the, you know, body and the subconscious kind of like reactions that we have and like um, the sensations, the uncomfortable sensations that come up in our body, because it's totally possible for us to keep on telling myself like, oh, I believe I'm worthy. I believe I'm worthy. I believe I'm worthy. But then when there's like an opportunity to show that I feel I'm worthy, if my body contracts and I get overwhelmed with fear and panic and anxiety, 
I'm not going to be able to move forward, even if I'm telling myself in my mind, you're safe to do this, like you're worthy, blah, blah, blah. I really found it empowering to learn more about somatic healing and connecting to your body and really working on releasing this trauma that's stored in your body so that these new beliefs actually feel safe in your body and you can embody them rather than just think them. You mentioned you start like understanding like this anxiety and you just wanted to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. Googling, like what is this feeling? <laughs> like my I have a I have a pain in my chest. Like these things that I know a lot of the folks who are listening right now, they may have been in the same situation. I can I can say that was a lot of time for me the same way. Like I, I had to just leave the home like in the middle of the night because I just felt this pain on my chest. And I, I just felt I couldn't breathe anymore. Like that kind of feeling that you're like, enough is enough. Like your body is like, come on, like, dude, just Google something at least, like drink some water, you know, like mm -hmm. that, that, that like basic survival methods. Um, so it's so interesting, like how you started seeing those signals. Have you seen the same paradigm in other friends uh, in your network? Has it been the same for them? Is it how they also like you started like realizing that, oh, I need to do something? Yeah. So I think this is a common thing for everyone because emotions, I see them as energy and emotion. So before your like when you first feel an uncomfortable emotion, it's that sensation in your body. And then your mind is like, this is uncomfortable. I need to make a story about this to understand why I feel this way. And going back to the book that I mentioned, U-Turn, it's by Ashley Stahl. That book spoke a lot about, you know, investigating your emotions and, you know, understanding what's causing this sensation in my body. And also just recognizing it as a sensation in the body because a lot of times when we experience these uncomfortable emotions and our mind jumps to make a story about it, we can end up projecting onto people around us. Meanwhile, that person around us may have nothing to do <laughs> with what's going on inside of our bodies. And I know that this is true, you know, even just from like experiences with my husband, like there are definitely times where like I project onto him and then later I'm like, okay, sorry, like that had nothing to do with you. I'm just like, I've been up for a while. I haven't had breakfast and I'm starting to feel a little cranky. So sorry. <laughs> like. I didn't mean that. And so I feel like having that awareness is a really beautiful thing because then you can realize, okay, this is just a sensation that's happening in my body. And I think it's so important to learn how to not intellectualize every single feeling because it's a very normal process to happen. But sometimes when we do that, we cause more pain and suffering for ourselves because we keep on like latching on to these stories that may or may not be true. And that's something that even today I still work through because, you know, Again, when you feel those emotions, like you said, it's like this pain in your chest, like you feel like you can't do anything. And for me, too, it's like you when you were talking about social media, it's like I consume all of this stuff about, you know, somatic healing and all these tips and tricks. And then sometimes when you're actually experiencing that emotion, it feels hard to actually get up and go do the thing, even if you know that's going to help you. And I think that also goes back to uh, like fight or flight responses when you are in that state your body might just like freeze. And so even though you know all of the things you can do to pull yourself out of that state, it might feel really difficult for you to actually get up and do it. And that's something I experience a lot. And so sometimes even just creating a list of like 10 things that you can do that are really simple and like don't take that much effort um, and like keeping it in places that you can see often can really help you get out of this, you know, state. And it's not something that happens overnight at all. I can definitely say that's true because like I said, you have to go from having a belief in your mind feel safe and also make sure that it feels safe in your body and your body stores so much trauma, not even just your own, but you know, your ancestors trauma as well. And there's this study that I think is so cool and so powerful that illustrates this is there was a study done on like mice or rats and they showed them this picture of a cherry blossom tree and they shocked them. And then they like these mice or rats became like super afraid of the cherry blossom tree anytime they saw it because they just were associating it with the shock. And then 
they like bred them. And two generations later, they showed the rats a cherry blossom tree and they like freaked out and ran away. And they had never, you know, experienced that shock, but their ancestors like two generations before did. And so it kind of shows how trauma can really be like passed down through generations. And so because of that, we have to be very patient with ourselves. And it's also cool to, you know, learn more about your ancestors. What did they go through? How can you bring that into your awareness and really bring in more compassion for yourself? Because when you look at, when you cultivate all of this self-awareness, it's really easy to get sucked into this shameful awareness where you become aware of these things that are holding you back. And then you get mad at yourself and you're like, why is this holding me back? Like, I want to move past this. But it's really like you have to have that loving investigation um, to really, you know, be like, okay, this is probably coming up because of X, Y, Z or whatever the case is. And really being like, I love and accept myself anyway, and I'm going to move at my own pace. And, you know, I think that's really the best way to approach it is because these things really can be like really hardwired into our bodies. And that's why so many people struggle with them um, in my perspective. The word loving investigation, I think it should be trademarked Mm -hmm. uh, because it's just so powerful. And you said something even prior to that, that sometimes we were just overanalyzing these feelings. And most, sometimes at least, not most of the times, but sometimes those things are even out of our understanding or out of our knowledge. Like I can't even like go and dig into my ancestors back in Iran, Mm -hmm. like all the traumas and the wars and everything that they went through. All I can do is accept that there is a possibility of that. And to your point, there are like scientific research that um, approves at least some of these hypotheses. And just say that hey, there, there is a possibility, and start like accepting it, and um, in in a loving way, and do, doing that investigation in a loving way. I think the combo of these two actually matters. Like we can't just say uh, I love myself, like whatever it is, I'm okay. That makes sense if we also accept the fact that there is a possibility that there are so many unknowns. But what does this feeling tell me? In a loving way, let's understand it. No matter what, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to get the help I need. I'm going to go to people who can help me. I'm going to put the shame away and talk to people about my traumas, like the things that you're doing and all of my guests have been doing on this show. I'm going to go and stop this cycle. I'm going to go talk about this thing and stop this cycle. So just doing the thing in a loving way, I Mm -hmm. think that's the shift of the paradigm we are talking here. And that's why I love that phrase that you said, uh, the loving investigation, it just makes it so much easier to understand how to do it. Like a lot of time we know the what, I think the loving investigation is a how, which I love here. I'm going to go back to some of the stories that you mentioned earlier. Um, We may have uh, skipped those quickly. Um, There was a list of things that got you to this point. There was a list of things you experienced as a kid, things you experienced in the family, things you experienced because you've been exposed to this complex, sick media that we are all dealing with on a daily basis. And things that may have not been any intention behind it. Like there are so many things that you've been exposed to that brought you to that point, pain in your chest and your body. Uh, I'm curious, and if that's something that you want to share, what was some of the biggest of those, at least based on your understanding so far, what was some of the biggest of those events? I think there are a few root causes that I have come to realize when it comes to you know, struggling to believe in myself at times, because that's something I've really been working on is just building up confidence in myself and really believing, like I said, that I'm worthy, all of these beliefs that we kind of worked on in those women empowerment groups. And some of the stories that come to mind that really impacted me when I was younger is um, I had a cousin <laughs> who often called me stupid, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, but that's something that lived in me for like the longest time. And it still does. Like I'm always afraid of people calling me stupid because it was just something that was like so hardwired into my brain growing up. 
I constantly am, you know, reminding myself that I'm smart <laughs> and all of those things and having that loving awareness of like, okay, you know, and also in the beginning of my healing journey, I did a lot of inner child healing. And so the things I'm talking about are things that really came forward when I did inner child healing to really kind of find out what are the root causes that are making me feel this way. So that was definitely one of the big ones is just, you know, kind of feeling a little bit bullied uh, growing up by him. Then the next story was in elementary school, there was a boy who had a crush on me. And he also, you know, went to Boy Scouts with my brother. He, uh, his sister danced with me. And so I would see him in school all of the time. And then I would see him also outside of school. And he was pretty influential with the other boys as well. And so in fourth grade, it kind of came to a head where um, he had been kind of like teasing me for a while and it kind of felt like harassment to me. It made me really uncomfortable, but you know, everyone around me kind of just thought it was cute. And so for me, it felt weird, you know, sometimes to express how uncomfortable I was because I didn't feel valid in that. You know, my brother had said something like at one point when I was crying over it uh, because he brought like a gift to my house, which like felt so like intrusive and everything, even though maybe he didn't mean it that way, of course. Like my brother said, because also since he was influential with the other boys, it turned into like all of the boys in my class liking me and like all of this attention that I just like didn't want. And so my brother was like, oh, like if all the boys in my class liked me, I mean, girls in my class liked me, I would be like thrilled. But it's also like I was probably like 10 at the time. So like I wasn't really interested in like male attention at that point of my life. Um, and I just wanted to like be free to feel like I wasn't being like watched all the time, which is definitely something that I had felt from that. And then on top of that, it's like, you know, uh, the culture, I will say, which I feel like he was a young boy, but he had older brothers. So these older brothers may have been speaking about women in specific ways that he picked up and then brought it to school and like was teaching me all of these like really inappropriate words that like I had no idea existed. And so like at this young age, I have this person like using all of these like inappropriate words towards me, you know, all of this unwanted attention that, you know, I didn't know how to speak up and advocate for myself about. And so even when I did, uh, there's this one vivid memory I have where he sang the song about me saying that I had a big dick, <laughs> which again, doesn't even make any sense. And especially as like a 10 year old girl, like, you don't, I don't know, it was just like not something that I was, you know, particularly excited about and so I started crying and I spoke to the lunch aides about it but I got like kind of dismissed and then I spoke to my fourth grade teacher about it and she was like stop being a baby and so from a young from a very young age I felt like you know if I'm being mistreated by a man it doesn't like nobody really cares you know because nobody really heard me or validated me during that time and I feel like that was, you know, one of the areas that led for me to have this like lower self-esteem was because one, I felt like I was always being watched. Um, I also got this feeling a lot growing up, especially from male attention, that I was always being looked at, but I was never like seen or like respected for like who I am as a person. And I feel like so some background on me as well, me and my current husband got married, you know, pretty quickly. So we were together for about two years and got married. And so it was kind of a shock to some people. But the reason I was able to make that decision like so quickly was because I had never felt more safe, you know, and seen by somebody. He was just somebody that was different than any male I had ever experienced before. And I was like, I can't let this go. Like, I need to hold on to this because it's so beautiful. And I think it's just a testament to, you know, the culture and you know like I think that the patriarchy a lot of times like spews all of these like negative you know characteristics out and like it hurts women in the most obvious ways that we see all the time you know through like the Me Too movement stories like mine um, but it also hurts men you know it, it gives men this feeling that they have to like always have it together and like they have to be strong and like it's like almost accepted the way that they like talk about women, like this locker room talk. And it's like, are you even thinking about what you're saying? Are you thinking about the impact it's having? And, you know, I don't think that it's benefiting most men, this like 
these societal structures that we have, like, as I said, it impacts women in the most obvious ways, but I also think it has like a really negative effect on men where they feel like they can't express their emotions. They bottle everything up. I mean, the suicide rate is like highest for men, all of these statistics. It's, you know, and that's why I'm so passionate about reclaiming the feminine is because I don't think it's only for women. I think it's so important for everybody because we all hold these masculine and feminine energies and it's about finding that balance about finding compassion. How can you think about other people and how your actions are impacting other people? And how can you have that compassion towards yourself? Because I think if you're not giving that compassion to yourself, how are you going to give it to other people? First of all, if Sid hears this conversation, hi, Sid. He's such an <laughs> amazing soul. I, I got to say, like, just, just a beautiful soul. I uh, we, we met once. I, I was also like, chatting with him on on this other thread that we had he's just like all all the positive energy genuine positive energy i just just love his energy so i said uh we love you and um your story resonates also i think in so many different ways like although uh i haven't experienced as a male i haven't experienced th this side of the story that you're mentioning but i think like it's very interesting how similar these paradigms are in different countries like for my iranian listeners they know probably like how the situation is actually very similar even probably worse in some cases and it doesn't matter if it's worse or better i think, mm -hmm. I think what matters is th these stories are true and what matters is they're still happening there are still kids in the school there are still kids in families there are still kids in so in our societies regardless of the boundaries regardless of the country names that these things are happening to them. Similar to this generational trauma we were talking a few minutes ago, like there are still wars happening in so many corners of this world, and there are still generation generational traumas being created one after another. And I think the awareness about how sensitive every one of these stories can be, and every single person's lives matter in this case, like this is just mind blowing to me how these stories are similar from the contextual perspective like there is there's is a story that someone is feeling being watched there's a story that someone doesn't know how to behave it's just happening over and over and that's why these stories matter so much to be talked about um i i think there's also another point here that i want to call out which i talked about it probably in previous episodes i definitely talked about it in my farsi podcast i turned it to a meditation a meditation of how to feel free how to feel the freedom and for me growing up there was always like this concept of freedom that i was hearing from people but i didn't know what that means and just recently i have i had this development in the past year that i started like really understanding freedom means i don't care i'm being watched Freedom means I'm not being watched. No one has the right to just continuously watch me. But on top of it, I think what I figured finally for me is like I feeling and not caring that I'm not I'm being watched and that level of freedom. And for a society that these things exist, these stories exist, none of us are free until we all really respect everyone's freedom in a way they deserve. So I think that's also like another way that your story resonated with me, which I think is really powerful. Like, again, comes back to the source of everything. Like our world is messed up because we have a hard time defining and understanding the definition of freedom for ourselves and respect it for others. That really resonated. And I think freedom for me, too, I completely understand what you're saying is because I have become so much more comfortable in who I am and really learning how to trust myself and develop that self-trust and, you know, always having like my own back, you know, and realizing the places that I'm giving my power away to other people. Like a silly example I can give as well is recently I had someone, you know, coming into my DMs debating me over things that I had shared. And it was really causing all of this stress in my life. And I'm like, why am I letting this like stranger pretty much impact me this much and cause this much stress in my life? And so I kind of stated my boundary, you know, because I wasn't going to just write him off right away. I said, you know, like, if you don't agree with me, that's fine. Like, we don't you don't have to, like, you know, 
keep coming into my space like this because I don't really think it's productive. Um, and then even after saying that, you know, the boundary was crossed again and I had to block them. And this was such, you know, I felt like I was gaslighting myself. I was, you know, not sure if I should trust my own instincts about the situation and trust that it's okay for me to decide to block somebody. And I think through that experience, I was like, I'm just like giving my power away to these people by like letting them have this impact on my life when sometimes you don't have to. Sometimes you do have the opportunity to walk away and place that boundary, which can also be difficult and it takes time to get to. You know, I'm still working on that because it is really difficult. Um, and of course you have to determine like, is this person worth putting that boundary? Like, you know, it's situational. It's not like just cut everybody out of your life that you don't like, but you know, finding that line of like, where am I giving my power away? How am I letting this person impact me in a way that like they, I, I can take that control back and I could say, no, you can't have this impact on me. I trust myself. I trust my instincts. And that's just like that for me. So that made a lot of sense to me. And I think that's been a huge liberating piece of my healing journey as well. Just trusting myself more. I think it's very interesting because a lot of time we think we need to find the people that we can trust. But the reality is you need to find the version of you that you can trust. Then the rest just will follow. Like uh, then you are a trusted individual. Then you attract trusted people. Then you can also like have the potentials and capabilities understand what to trust, what not to trust. I think a lot of time we can't trust other people because we are not trusting ourselves. And this mm-hmm. this concept I think is very interesting. We always like put it when it comes to trust, we other we always put it on other people. Oh yeah, I cannot trust this friend. I cannot trust this partner of mine. And why not actually invest in trusting yourself? And because it comes handy in a lot of places. Even if somebody doesn't give you freedom, then you can first start trusting yourself about wanting freedom, about trying to defining freedom for yourself, trying to defining your boundaries, using the tools you have, such as simple blog features. Like in this mm-hmm. story, it's a feature is provided to you, use it. But when you trust you're in the right state and mm-hmm. that's a process, it's a process for you to trust yourself so that you can use these tools, these societal benefits, and also like try to define those. If the society doesn't, define it for you, then by trusting yourself, you can start being that person that defines these. You can start becoming a role model for other people eventually that can define what does trust mean in a social media or in a friend group or in a, in a country. So I think that, that, that concept is something I'm, I'm consistently thinking like, do I need to trust anyone or do I need to just trust myself? Yeah. Um, that resonates a lot for me because in my past, I've had a lot of, you know, difficult relationships and in, in certain situations, I felt like I was really manipulated or in situations I've looking back on, I'm like, why did I go along with that? Like, why did I allow this to happen? And I think that goes back to me just like not having strong self-esteem at the time where, you know, I just kind of went along with it because I didn't think anything better was going to come along. But as I went through my healing journey and, you know, started, you know, there was some, you know, friendships that left and some that came in. And I was nervous when I started making new friends because I was like, I don't want to find myself in that situation again where I'm getting manipulated or someone's crossing my boundaries consistently. And how do I avoid that? How do I make sure I'm trusting the right people? How do I make sure I'm letting the right people into my space? And the more that I go on with my life, after, you know, all of this healing that I've done, I've realized that it's not really about like who's allowed to be in my space and who's not, but it's about where do I put down my boundaries when I need them? When do I say no when I feel I should say no? And so it's like, I feel like I don't have to have these like explosive moments anymore in relationships because I feel like I know how to set my boundaries better and make sure I don't go like super far down something that isn't right for me. I feel like learning how to trust yourself to know when to put boundaries and when to say, okay, you know, I don't think this relationship is working or whatever the case is, but I feel like I have this, you know, weight lifted off of me in my relationships. I'm less scared (laughs) in my relationships and I'm more empowered because I know like I can say no when I need to, where in the past it was like really hard for me to say no. Um, and I would get like super worked up, um, 
because I wanted to say no, but I felt like I couldn't. And so it caused all of the stress and struggle in the relationship, which I feel like now has really lessened for me, which has been a really nice experience. I'm curious uh, if there are examples of those hard conversations or that ended up uh, ending a relationship or a friendship. How can I start saying no? Or how can I start actually having those difficult conversations? How do you navigate that? Yeah, so I had a a recent friend breakup, which was really difficult for me, actually. And I still have a lot of love in my heart for this person. Um, But the relationship itself just wasn't really working out at the time. And so, you know, we had multiple conversations. Uh, I voiced how I was feeling multiple times because I really wanted to, you know, express what was on my mind because I had felt for a while I was getting frustrated in this relationship and you know these little tiny things were just like building up that sometimes I didn't even know if they were really significant or not but they were just like weighing on me for some reason and it was just making the the relationship really hard for me to be a part of and I decided you know what I'm not going to hold these things back anymore because I was always afraid to cause a fight or like hurt someone's feelings but I was like you know what like I feel more empowered at this time I'm going to just share what's on my mind because this relationship isn't really working on my end. So like, let me try to fix the areas that I feel like it's not working. I tried to have a few conversations and I felt like some of those conversations went well where we were able to hear each other. But a lot of times when I had initially shared those feelings, it would end up, you know, I would get a FaceTime and, you know, they would be screaming at me or like, you know, like really angry at what I said. And I was like, listen, like, I really wasn't saying this to like make you super angry. Like I was just trying to express how I'm feeling right now. And so that we can talk about it and move on from it. And so because I wasn't really getting that, and even after we had conversations where I had expressed these boundaries, I felt like they were still continuously being crossed. And I think that's really like my way of knowing when to end a relationship it's like I of course always you know first try to communicate with the person and you know express how I'm feeling and if I state my boundary and I place that boundary and it's still just consistently getting crossed then it's like okay like I think I need space from this and so in that situation I did say I needed space and I said indefinite space because I didn't know how much time I needed, but I just knew that I needed space from the relationship and I didn't want to put a timeline on it because I didn't want to feel like pressure to like come back and revisit this because I literally had no idea how I was feeling. I was just kind of at my wit's end because I was frustrated and I was in the heat of the moment. And so that's how I approached it. And then there were a few times after that where I did try and re- reach out again, you know, to say like, hey, you know, I never meant for us to be enemies. Um, I just, you know, was really feeling overwhelmed in that moment. I needed space and tried to, you know, reconnect and just, you know, share. I didn't mean to hurt her or anything like that. Um, And it was just crickets. (laughs) Uh, Both times I tried to reach out, times that I would see this person, there was just no interest in connecting with me. And so at that point, it was like, you know what, the relationship is over and I'm moving on and I had to heal from that. But in my opinion, it's like, if you, you know, try to clearly communicate your boundaries and the person is just not listening, they're continuously doing the same thing over and over again, you have to get to a point where you're like, okay, I don't deserve this anymore. I've done my part of trying to communicate and nothing is changing. So it's time I move on. Um, And that can be a really difficult decision. You know, I was friends with this person for a really long time. Uh, We had a lot of really close memories, but um, ultimately it was the right decision for me. And I feel like through making space, you know, I attracted so many connections that are truly right for me and support me and, you know, give me all the things that like I would expect in a friendship, especially just like respecting boundaries. That's like a number one thing for me. I think it's very important to have these examples discussed because a lot of the times we are so stuck in all the good uh stories like you're mm-hmm. you're a pro storyteller sorry if i'm i'm, I'm <laughs> preaching here but a lot of time we are so uh focused on like the good stories good friendships at the same time i think these are stories of friendships not going the way they had to and it's totally fine the friendships that we are losing or the friendships that didn't work these are stories also like matter a lot because hearing them tells me as a as ali that hey it's it's normal. Like mm-hmm. f- folks go through 
friendships, go through breakups with their friends. It's totally normal that sometimes in a conversation, you f- if you feel that way, that you have to, at least for a while, put a pause on a friendship, do it. You have that power. Be mm-hmm. Just be transparent, be communicative. Now I have the tool. Try to make sure your feelings are thoroughly communicated without disrespecting that other friend. And if they are they don't have the capacity and the love to understand it, it's also totally fine. Maybe they're also like going through their own uh, right. stages of lives. We don't have to always align. We don't have right. to always align because friendships can also break and it's totally fine. So thank you so much for sharing that. I, I sent yeah. all of this to <laughs> share my genuine thanks for why I think sharing the other side of the stories matter too. And that mm-hmm. that to me is a storytelling. If we're always bombarded by these bite-sized fun stories like then life starts like feeling unreal and I feel down but this this really helps me as a person to understand life has everything together good or bad doesn't mean anything like all together means something and one thing that I'll say when you're talking about the boundaries is I think it's really important for the person on the other side of the boundary. You know, if your friend is setting some type of boundary with you, um, especially in the case of me and my friend that, you know, went our separate ways, I can say that I was setting that boundary not because I hated her, but it was more so just to protect myself from what I was experiencing that was really unsettling for me. And so I think it's important for people to know that, you know, I can have like so much love for you as a human and always care for you and always want the best for you. But at the same time, feel like I need to set this boundary for myself. And so I think that's important to recognize as well, because I think sometimes it can really feel like rejection or something in the moment. And then that, you know, kind of causes a lot of other normal human emotions and reactions, but kind of, you know, recognizing that like maybe this isn't really like anything about like me as a human, but also just like about like how she's experiencing the situation. And maybe it's best if we do have space. Maybe I can focus on myself while she focuses on herself. And then maybe we can see where it goes. But um, I think it's important to not always just like immediately jump to like the worst conclusion and like that feeling of rejection, because sometimes that's not really the case. If you don't mind, I I have a couple of like usual questions I like to ask. This is like now you're an ally uh, on this show. So as an ally, we we would love to know, like to keep your mental health in a good state in general, like what are some of the things you do um, if, if you don't mind sharing those with us? So I am actually super excited because I'm starting yoga teacher training (laughs) this next week, actually. Um, I just got all of my books and everything, so I'm reading. Uh, But I would first say that reading has been a huge positive for me, just like going towards books that have like information that feels helpful. And someone who I love to read uh, his work is Young Pueblo. And, you know, I was going through, you know, a tough time this past summer, uh, just a lot of life stresses weighing on me. And, you know, my brain was like feeling super scattered. I was feeling like I was in a funk and I just like was grasping at straws to try and like keep myself sane. And I ended up picking up lighter, um, by young Pueblo. And it was just like, the words were medicine for me. Um, some other things I will do is I'll try to keep, you know, a consistent morning routine, but I feel like every morning is different for me and it's hard for me to be very like rigid with that. So I'll also journal a lot. If there's things on my mind, um, I'll just write it all out. But I would say for the most part, I'm pretty open to like any type of like practice that will help. I recently just started doing like EFT with one of my prior clients. She's getting into that space. And so, you know, it's tapping on different uh, points. It's almost like a needleless acupuncture. And it really helps you kind of like rewire your subconscious through tapping on those points. So that's something else that I've been doing to really help, you know, work with my inner narrative. Um, And so what I will say is like, there are so many different ways that you can do it. And it's kind of just like about figuring out what works best for you. Some people may have like one thing that they live and die by, but I kind of will just like try a bunch of different things. And I think the most important thing for me is just finding an avenue to like connect back to my body or like release the things that are like weighing me down. Um, And so those are some of the examples, but like I said, it's always changing. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's a that's an interesting summary of like finding a way back to my body. 
holds the secret answer here. And I, th- I think um, it's an interesting summary. And thank you for gifting that to us. With that said, like with all of our guests on the show, uh, we are holding them accountable, or we are trying. You don't have to. We are we are holding them accountable to do an activity with at least a few of our listeners uh, for about a month. Uh, and if you were to choose that activity, what would that be like? What would you like to do as far as an activity with a group of our listeners? I would say for a month, do a body scan every morning. You know, just you know, scan your body, think about each part of your body, think about your head, then go down to each other body part and just tap into, you know, what sensations are you feeling in your body at that time and then journal about it after because I think that, you know, obviously emotions live in the body and we learn so much from our emotions if we're able to just listen to them. And I think, you know, cultivating that awareness and that ability to listen to our emotions and what they might be telling us Um, A great way to start doing that is by starting with a body scan and really paying attention um, to what you're feeling, because it can be difficult sometimes to, you know, think back and be like, what does that like? How can I describe that sensation I was feeling? So it's always good to kind of like cultivate that awareness and become more clear on that because it can really open up so much for you in terms of mental clarity and just improvements in your life overall. That's awesome. (laughs) <laughs> is there a quick version of that that you can guide us to right now, like a two-minute version of it? And I encourage people to journal after it. Maybe they can just start actually now. Is there? Sure. Can we yeah. can we ask you for that gift? So this is kind of similar to the yoga nidra practice I did earlier. So it works out perfectly. Um, but if you want to start by closing down your eyes and first start by focusing on your throat. And really connect to your voice or, you know, your passions, the things that make you you. Next, bring your awareness to your right shoulder. And imagine it becoming still or focus on any sensation that arises. Next, bring your awareness down your right arm to your right hand. Now we're going to take it in reverse. So go back up your right arm, back to your right shoulder. Now the other side, focus on your left shoulder, down your right arm, I'm sorry, left arm, (laughs) to your left hand. You can take it in reverse to see if any other new sensations come up. And if there's nothing there, don't force anything. Don't overthink it. Just let it be. Finding your way back at your left shoulder. Travel up to the top of your head or your crown chakra. Notice any thoughts that may be coming up that are distracting you from this practice. And just let them drift away. From there, travel down to your torso. Is there any tightness or contraction? Can you release that a little bit? Or if it's really overwhelming, what might it be telling you? From there, move down your legs. Do 
to the bottom of your feet. Maybe you notice the ground beneath you and you ground into that a little bit firmer. Now, take the time to revisit any part of your body that may have felt, you know, the most tension or, you know, the most uncomfortable sensation or somewhere that you felt the most expanded. And just take some time to sit with it without questioning it. And when you feel ready, maybe bring some wiggles back into your feet and your fingers. And slowly open your eyes, bring yourself back into this space and reflect on any of those sensations that you may have felt through that practice. <laughs> that was fantastic. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna write down my journal after it to commit to what you're committed to. Uh, I told you earlier before the show that usually almost every time before any of my recordings, I feel down. And then after mm. it, I'm like this sharp baby. And <laughs> I mean, our conversation was amazing and I hope everybody enjoyed it. But this part of it just took it to another level. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you for guiding us through this. Is there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Is there anything else that you want to say? Yeah. Well, first I'll just say thanks so much for having me. This is so fun. It's always so nice chatting with you. And I hope all of the listeners gain something from this conversation, no matter you know who they are, whether they're a woman or a man or <laughs> whatever their background is. I hope that they can find a piece of it they connect to. If my story did resonate and you want to reach out, you can find me at storytellersgrove.com. Uh, at Storytellers Grove um, on Instagram or storytellersgrove.com. I always love to hear from people and connect with others who are on a similar path and similar journey. So yeah, that's where you can find me if you'd like to. <laughs> that's that's awesome. Thank you for sharing that resource. I will also like put the links into the show notes. So thanks again, Amanda. Um, I hope to see you back again on the show. Like the, this was a great conversation. Wishing you the best in your path that you're taking. I know a lot of exciting things already happened and coming up. Thanks again. Thank you. That was our conversation with Amanda. I hope you also enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As we discussed, the accountability campaign for this episode is a combo of body scanning meditation and journaling in the morning. If you would like to join this campaign, please use the link in the show notes. And I hope to see you all in the next episodes of The Ally Show.